Thank you. I wish to thank the organizers for inviting me to talk about endovascular fistula creation for dialysis access. So I'm going to give you an update on this Everlink endo-AVF system. So in 1966, a game changer for hemodialysis vascular access happened and was reported by Brescia, Semino, and colleagues actually here in New York. What they described was the creation of an arterial venous fistula, which is an anastomosis between an artery and a vein with surgical stitches. And since that time, the arterial venous fistula has become the optimal dialysis for uh, access for dialysis because of its low complication rate and high patency as long as it matures. You can see this beautiful fistula here, but in reality, we now know today that 20 to 60 percent of all of our fistulas created are actually not usable for dialysis due to the high failure to mature rate, and as you heard from our previous speaker, the high intervention rate, and this often leads to uh, patient dissatisfaction. So I think it's now time for a new perspective and new innovation for dialysis access and AV fistula creation. So there's a new system that you may have heard about. It's called the Everlink Endo-AVF system. And what it is is there are catheters lined with rare earth magnets. So this is the venous catheter. And you can see in the middle of this venous catheter is a radiofrequency electrode. In the middle of the arterial catheter is a ceramic backstop. So what happens is the venous catheter gets put in a vein. The arterial catheter gets put into the artery. The catheters are aligned by the magnets that attract each other so that the radiofrequency electrode and the ceramic backstop are aligned. Through a radiofrequency generator, this radiofrequency uh, electrode is deployed. Radiofrequency energy is given in a, by in approximately two seconds, creating a channel between the artery and the vein, and the fistula is created. The catheters are removed, and there is no extravasation, and a patient gets to leave the suite. So for the rest of this presentation, I do want to tell you that this system is not available for sale yet in the United States, and it's under FDA review. I'm going to show you a video of how this system works. So you see here, this is the catheters uh, going into the arterial site. The venous catheter is going to advance to where the fistula will be created. You will see the magnets align and attract. The radiofrequency electrode will be deployed giving two seconds of radiofrequency energy, and a fistula is created. You can see a fistula created here without any extravasation. If the patient has more than two brachial veins, a brachial vein will be embolized to redirect flow from the deep system to the superficial system to allow that fistula to develop nicely. And that's the final fistulogram showing no extravasation. So that is the technology, and what I want to share with you is the study that demonstrates its efficacy and safety. So the name of the study is NEAT, the Novel Endovascular Access Trial, looking at this Everlink endo-AVF system to create an endovascular fistula in pre-dialysis and dialysis patients who need a vascular access. So the purpose of the study is to evaluate the safety and efficacy of this system. The primary endpoint is looking at uh, maturation as defined by brachial artery flow of greater than 500 milliliters per minute and a vein diameter of greater than 4 millimeters per minute. In order to uh, demonstrate this, we needed 80 patients, 60 valuable patients, and 20 roll-in patients. Because this is new technology, we wanted to make sure that the operators had an opportunity to be able to use this technology before entering into the study. The first fistula was created in uh, 2014. Billy Cohn is the inventor of these, cath these magnet-lined catheter system. Daraj Rajan was the interventionist, and I was the clinical trialist, making sure everything went OK. So in terms of uh, the flow, we had uh, a number of patients who were eligible. We enrolled our 80 patients. We had our 60 evaluable patients and the rolling cohorts. And we followed them for 12 months. So I will show you these 12-month uh, results. Uh, just to let you know, for the, pa the people out there who are very familiar with dialysis, you can see that this population is very representative of a dialysis population. BMI of greater than 25 in um, over 60% of our patients. 65% of them were diabetic. 92% had hypertension. About a third of them already had a previous fistula created. And a little over 50% were actually pre-dialysis patients needing a vascular access. The primary outcomes, um, the technical success was quite very high, 98% technical success. We only had one procedure that failed. Uh, the operator used a braided introducer sheath, which caused inadequate RF energy to be delivered, and a fistula was not created. 
Uh, in terms of serious uh, procedure or device related adverse events, five out of the six patients uh, had this, um, and the majority of the events were due to the entry and exit um, uh, of these um, catheters. In terms of the primary outcome, the fistula maturation, this is our target blood flow. You can see that it was achieved after a week and was maintained to the 12 months. Uh, the target vessel diameter was reached for all of the outflowing veins, the median cubital, the cephalic vein, and the basilic vein. In terms of the clinical implications, so this is what you see in terms of uh, the fistula development really nicely um, early on, five days after the procedure. There's no incision uh, line scar and there's minimal vessel trauma. Um, so you actually do not see any scarring. So your nurses will need to get used to cannulating without that uh, surgical scar as a, a, a pointer. Um, and then at one month, you can see that the vein is really nicely developed, ready for cannulation with multiple cannulation zones available. In terms of functional usability, very similar to surgical fistulas, 67% of them were functional. Um, of note, only 12% of them needed a facilitative intervention for it to be functional. The time to two-needle cannulation was very respectable, and because it was in the context of a clinical trial, we were very, very cautious with regards to cannulating it because we never had experience with this fistula before. So why were patients not cannulated for those that were not? Uh, three were late thrombosis, uh, two of the veins were too deep. Two patients, regardless of whether or not they would have gotten a surgical or endovascular created fistula, would never have gone on to use their fistulas because of uh, very significant uh, uh, needle phobia. Um, one patient had steel, and one patient was transferred to an unfamiliar study site, and they said, we don't know what this is, we're not going to cannulate it, forget it. Um, in terms of thrombosis, this is the early thrombosis rate in our study, 1.8% compared to the surgical literature at 5 to 26%. Late thrombosis after six months was 5.3 to 10.5% compared to the surgical literature of 14 to 26%. In terms of uh, post-creation procedures, we did a subsequent study looking at a propensity score matched Medicare cohort. So we took a 5% Medicare cohort, matched them up, and looked at the intervention rates. And our intervention rate uh, using the endovascular fistula was 0.6 per patient year compared to 3.4 per patient year for surgical fistula. And that represents approximately a six times fewer post-creation procedures needed for endovascular uh, fistulas to achieve the same uh, usability endpoint. In terms of uh, patency, this is our uh, primary patency here at 68.6%, with a secondary patency of 83.5%. And how does this compare to the surgical literature? This was a meta-analysis of 46 publications in 62 unique cohorts with over 12,000 patients. And you can see the primary patency in the surgical literature is approximately 60% and 71% uh, secondary patency. So we're about the same um, or better than the surgical literature. This is the first patient who had the fistula created. This was a, a pre-dialysis patient. Um, and she's using her endovascular fistula at six months. And because we've had uh, previous patients uh, in another study that are a pilot study um, uh, evaluating this technology, this patient uh, is now using his endovascular fistula for approximately three years. So I just want to say a special thanks to the investigational sites. Um, uh, there's six sites from Canada, three sites from New Zealand and Australia, and I forgot to show my disclosures. I'm supported by a personnel award from the Heart and Stroke Foundation in Canada. Um, so to conclude, the NEAT study demonstrates that the endovascular technology can reliably create AV fistulas without open surgery. The endo-AVF, which is what we coined it, can be used successfully for dialysis delivery and has a high primary and secondary patency. And importantly for nephrologists and caregivers, the endo-AVF can provide an alternative option for hemodialysis access for your patients. And I was very, very fortunate because I actually uh, met Dr. Brescia, and he saw this presentation and saw the endo fistula, and he gave me the thumbs up. He said he liked it. Thank you very much.